th I think it's important because one of the, the, the patient population that we really desire to treat with advanced OAB options are the patients that are refractory to overactive bladder. These are my disclosures, the same as before. And the um, AUA and SUFA pr provides a nice algorithm to help guide physicians and patients through the overactive bladder pathway. And like Dr. Baum said, I think a lot of these patients that we, that we consider fail pharmacologic treatment fail because of poor compliance with the medication therapy. But I would say that even with strict adhe adherence to therapy, a significant proportion still will be considered refractory. And these are the patients that we have to move into this advanced OAB platform. And that's the, the uh, different options highlighted there in red and are, are shown here in blue. I think we're all familiar with these three options and they're in no particular order. Botulinum toxin or onobotulinum toxin A is an office-based procedure that uh, we can offer to patients if they're willing and able to catheterize themselves because the downside or potential side effect, the main side effect is incomplete emptying and the need to catheterize. The clinical trials showed uh, rates of five to six percent double in patients that are diabetic. Some other real world series have shown higher rates. I think you have to be concerned in patients that have elevated post-void residuals, diabetic patients, and male patients that could have bladder outlet obstruction. These are the ones you'd want to counsel. And then we have uh, PTNS, which is an office-based procedure where patients come in once a week for 30-minute treatment sessions and then continue with maintenance therapy once a month uh, there on out. Uh, the, a recent, uh, uh, a recent uh, presentation at the AOA showed that patients didn't persist after a year. Only 30% of patients persisted after a year with PTNS. So we're even dealing with compliance issues with this advanced OAB options as well. The downside, I think, for many of these patients is the frequent visits to the office, the logistical constraints. Patients just uh, get tired. It's either ineffective or they can't make those visits to the hospital. And then the other option is sacral neuromodulation. This requires two procedures. It requires a test phase and then an implant phase. So it's a little more invasive, you could say, than other procedures. And the, uh, the main restriction is that currently patients can get a, a, they can get a low intensity MRI of the brain with 1.5 Tesla, but they can't get an MRI of the neck below. So that restricts a large population of our patients that may need MRI for other conditions uh, that, uh, we, that, uh, that we uh, do not treat. And so what I wanted to focus a lot on this talk was some since we're uh, aware of these current therapies, there's some novel therapies that are on the horizon that may be have become available to us in the next several years to treat patients with refractory overactive bladder. And this first option is a recha rechargeable sacral neuromodulation device. And as I stated before, this was brought about because the current sacral neuromodulation requires two procedures and it requires it has a non-rechargeable battery that requires exchange on an average of every 4.4 months. So this new device with a rechargeable d battery has a calculated lifespan of up to 15 years. So potentially patients could use this device and not have to go in for revisions for 15 years. And that they've estimated cost savings of $12 billion over, over this period of time. So this was a study, it was based out of Europe. It was a multi-center study with a one-year follow-up in patients, 51 patients with refractory overactive bladder. This is the battery itself. It's about a little larger than a quarter. It's about one-third the size of the non-rechargeable sacral neuromodulation battery that we currently have available. And this is the study design. Basically, every patient underwent a, a implant of the time lead and the battery that I just showed before. And then at two weeks or one month, they were assessed to see if they were considered a positive test responder. And what was that? Well, that was a greater than or equal to a 50% change or reduction in either their urgent continency episodes or their frequency. And all patients were followed whether they were a test responder or not up through a year. And so 71% of patients, or 34 out of 51, were considered test responders at this initial visit. They had follow-up visits on 43 out of 51 patients, so most patients followed up, including 32 out of 34 responders. And you can see that the, the therapy response rate, which is the same criteria as w which was a test response, a greater than 50 percent reduction in their symptoms, persisted or actually improved over this time course through three, six, and 12 months. The mean, the mean urgent continence episodes decreased from 8.3 down to 1.8 at one year follow-up. And even the patients that were non-test responders that were still followed, 
the 17 patients, 55% of them still had moderate or, or were moderately or very satisfied with the results. So it just showed that even the patients that, that maybe didn't hit that 50% threshold were still satisfied with what occurred. So it was a single stage procedure with the, with the lead and the battery implant at the same time. This is the U.S.-based follow-up. The uh, first one was European. This is U.S.-based. Same device in 129 patients that is actually it hasn't been published yet, but it had a six-month follow-up. And they showed similar results that 90% of patients actually were considered therapy responders at six months. They also showed improvements in quality of life scores as well. Patients were very satisfied with charging the device averaged about once a week for one hour. So they were very compliant with it and, and satisfied, at least during this trial. In, in either study, there was, there was a small number of explants. The first study was three, the second study, this study two. Uh, one was for infection and two was because it, it, it lacked efficacy. So not many adverse events related to it. The main adverse event was uh, in 20% of patients that had uncomfortable stimulation that required reprogramming. So the potential benefit of this is it's single stage, they can, they can recharge it at home but you have to realize that 20% of patients still had to come into the office to recharge it because this device, as opposed to the current sacral nerve modulation, only has one program in it, built into it. They did it because they think it's less complicated for patients, but it also means if it's not working, they have to come into the office. And so they'll have to look, you know, in future about, you know, office visits and cost of that and, and how that affects, you know, patient satisfaction as well. What about an implantable tibial nerve stimulation device. The downside of the current PTNS uh, options that we have now is patients have to come to the office frequently, right? And they either may live far away or don't have transportation. They just can't do it. They have other things going on or they take trips. And if they miss a couple weeks, then they've lost the benefit of therapy and then they have to start over again. So companies have started designing these implantable PTNS therapies. There's several out there uh, being researched, but one that published that I wanted to talk about was uh, this device that was uh, looked at in 46 patients with refractory urge incontinence. It's a primary battery that also functions as the neuromodulation device. This is the procedure itself. It's the shape and size of a nickel. It's called the e-coin, and it can be done in the office under local anesthesia, make a small incision. They have this device that helps line up the markings where you're going to mark where the device will sit, and then you make a little incision about a half or or one centimeter cephalid to that, and, and you just kind of tunnel it into a pocket. They, uh, well, the device will be activated four weeks after it's implanted, and it's automatically programmed to stimulate patients every two days for 30-minute treatment sessions, and then after 12 weeks, every, and then they do every 15 days. And because it's, a, it's intermittent stimulation, they, they, these batteries should last a long time. It's not something that's going to have to be frequently changed. These are some of the results. At, uh, at six months showing a reduction in the urgent incontinence episodes from uh, a mean of 4.2 down to 1.7 at, at, uh, at three months, and then the, the white column is at six months, it went down to 1.5. So significant reduction in that. 67% of patients were clinically successful, meaning greater than 50% reduction in the urgent incontinence episodes. That's the number that, that all these treatments are using as a standard and actually 24% of patients were dry with this therapy, and that persisted for six months. The uh, mean time to implant was only 17 minutes, and no device was explanted related to pain, infection, or migration. One patient did have migration of the device. He actually uh, did a lot of bicycling right after implantation. It migrated post more posteriorly, and it wasn't effective. So now what they do is they have patients, you know, they restrict their activities, and they wear an ankle brace for several weeks to allow that device to encapsulate. If we could think of like the ideal treatment for patients with overactive bladder, I think we want to target the sensory nerves. We want to block that the reflex from occurring right where it's initiated without having, you know, effects on the motor control of the bladder. We want patients to be able to empty their bladder but but block that reflex. And that's where bladder denervation comes in. And we've heard about the prior studies with the Engelman Sunberg, uh, you know, those surgeries that had you know, partial success, but not really, really great success. So Roberton and colleagues looked at a, a novel therapy using radio frequency ablation of the subtrigonal sensory nerves. And this is one year follow-up. It's a follow-up study of, of uh, uh, the initial publication that was 12 week follow-up. It was a multi-center international study. And this is the proprietary device that delivers the radio frequency uh, 
energy. Basically, there's a, a suction device that it, once you, you, you uh, isolate the trigone itself, the suction device pulls the urethelium against the device, and then these, these uh, electrodes are inserted three millimeters below the surface, and then radio frequency, they, they looked at 10 seconds versus 60 seconds. They didn't see any complication, and so a better benefit. So now the standard is 60 seconds of radio frequency ablation, and then they just kind of march along. You can see there's different paths where they've kind of ablated. They uh, followed patients uh, for one year. 83% had one-year follow-up, and you can see that the benefits, the reduction in urgent continence episodes are seen it as early as one month after the procedure, and then the full benefits realized about three months, and it persists for 12 months. So they, they had, you know, they had significant benefit even one year after the procedure. They haven't followed or haven't published, at least, or followed past that point, but they saw a significant benefit. They did find that 69% of patients had, we talk again, clinical success, meaning greater than or equal to 50% reduction in urgent continence episodes. The dry rate wasn't as high as the other studies, it was 10%, and the adverse events was 17%. Most of them were minor, a little dysuria, a little, uh, maybe a little discomfort. They did have one significant adverse event, a patient developed polynephritis and hydronephrosis and had to be stented. They, they later found out this patient had a uh, unrecognized congenital ipsilateral ureterocele. So now they, they, they are more careful working up patients, making sure there's no underlying anatomic abnormalities that could put them at risk for a potential obstruction from this procedure. So I think, you know, I think this, this shows, you know, sig pretty significant results at, at, at uh, one year. It's really not a, a controlled study. There's no uh, sham control or anything like that. And I think, you know, we have to take with a grain of salt and need more data based on prior results with some of the surgical procedures, but it is a novel therapy that it really targets these sensory nerves, and if you can get a one-year benefit with very little risk, I think it would be a, a good option for patients. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about transcutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. Some investigators are even looking and saying, hey, what about if we just put a patch over the leg and stimulated, allow them to stimulate at home? Could this be as effective or have some effect over implanting some device or putting a needle in? And so. A recent publication that came out this year looked at, did a systematic review of all studies looking at uh, both overactive and neurogenic. They, they found 10 random, uh, they found 10 randomized controlled trials, uh, three large prospective cohort studies totaling 629 patients. Seven out of 10 trials were actually idiopathic, predominantly idiopathic overactive bladder. S nine studies reported changes in OAB symptoms with a significant improvement in 48 to 93 percent. Three studies looked at urgent continence with cure rates of 25 to 43 percent. No adverse events, obviously. And they were able to extract from two randomized trials that looked at a, a quality of life score, the urgent continence score, and they found that the, the, the TTNS group compared to control, there was significant improvement in the urgent continence in these two groups. But the problem with the, the current literature out there is there's no standardized you know, treatment for the frequency or duration of treatment. Some were giving it, you know, every other day. Some were giving it weekly. Some biweekly, for different durations. So it has to really be, uh, you know, standardized to look at. And most of the follow-up was all 12 weeks. So we need longer follow-up to really see if it's beneficial. I will say that one recent publication just came out this year actually randomized patients between TTNS and PTNS. It was 34 patients, and they. Uh, treated the patients for once a week for 30-minute treatment sessions for 12 weeks. And they were, their hypothesis was that the TTNS would be non-inferior non to PTNS. It would be just as good. And they actually showed that. They showed that the daytime uh, frequency was uh, significantly reduced with TTNS. You can see on the left column as well as the number of urgency episodes as well as incontinence episodes. They also found that the quality of life scores improved in both groups significantly greater than that, the mean significant uh, difference of 10. And so they did, at least in this study, seem to suggest that TTNS ha had a similar effect as PTNS, at least in the short term. So this is what we may see in the future for the clinical algorithm for answer advanced OAB. So you see a lot of options available, and we're going to have to know how to, how to place these in place. If TTNS becomes an option, some think it may be moved up as high as with medication with right below behavioral treatment because there's no adverse events. It's going to be easy just to start that. And where these other ones fit in will really depend on how effective they are and probably you know, patient compliance and, uh, and cost. 
but what I would like to finish up is kind of the, to think back to that clinical care pathway and think back to what Dr. Debaum said about the poor compliance with medication and, and that a lot of patients, even if they are compliant, are going to have refractory overactive bladder and recognize that we do have effective treatment for advanced OAB now, whether it's PTNS, onobotulinum toxin, or sacronormodulation. We do have these treatments, but a lot of these patients aren't aware of these, right? And so they're lost to follow up because if or when they fail medication therapy, they don't think there's an, any other option. They think they just have to live with these symptoms. And so these patients aren't educated. So it's important that if you're treating these patients up front, even if you aren't providing these treatments for them, that you at least educate patients to say, hey, if you don't get better from these medication, there's some other options available. Some involve we can inject your bladder with Botox. Others involve electrical stimulation. You don't have to necessarily go in great detail, but just let them know there are treatments available so that they are willing to come back. A lot of patients aren't satisfied when they see the urologist and they just hand them more medication because their primary care gave them medication. They say, well, you're, you're the expert. You're just giving me the same thing that he gave me, and then it doesn't work. And they're like, well, I'm not going back paying a higher copay to that guy. So at least educate them about that and have referrals in place for at least physicians you know that, that can treat with some of these options for these patients. I will say that as that, uh, all these other options become available, our tool toolbox for advanced OAB is going to expand. And when I counsel patients, when I see them in the clinic, I'm wearing my, my uh, white coat, I'll tell patients, look, we got, I got a lot of tricks up my sleeve, and I got long sleeves, and these sleeves are going to get even longer with, with all these options. So just please be aware of uh, how, to, how to push patients through this pathway and educate them on these advanced OAB options. And hopefully down the road we'll be talking more about some of these novel treatments.